Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. A K2 Medical Alert looking to ward off diabetes? You might try lighting up a joint. New research published in the American Journal of Medicine found a link between marijuana and blood sugar control. Weed smokers in the study had lower levels of insulin resistance. High resistance can lead to diabetes. The pot users also had smaller waistlines. That's another positive because weight around the middle can indicate or be a precursor to diabetes. Scientists say the receptors in the brain triggered by marijuana may speed up metabolism. Ricky Lake, one of her millions of fans with her own talk show, but what she's talking about now may actually shock a lot of them. She's advocating using pot for children, but it's children fighting cancer. Look, she knows it's controversial, but she's not shying away from it. She tells our special correspondent, Jay Williams, marijuana could save young lives. This is her cannabis oil regimen that we have right now. We give her the size of about a half a grain of rice two times a day with uh, baby food. Mm, that's it. And there's a particular family that you're following in this documentary. You know, Tracy, Josh, and their baby, Sophie. What led you to this family? So via social media, we found this baby, and she was diagnosed at seven months old. And you know, we're talking about this baby that has this brain tumor, um, and they're seeing unprecedented results with chemotherapy and and cannabis at the same time. We're gonna fight till the end. We're not gonna stop until this cancer is gone. Are you ready? Are you ready to kick cancer in the butt? Sophie's treatment is not legal on a federal level. Marijuana is still a Schedule I drug and is in the same category as heroin and ecstasy. Despite the fact that 21 states plus D.C. allow medical marijuana. I'm certainly not encouraging drug use. I mean, I am very clear that I am not an expert. I am not a doctor. I am a mother, and, I, and I'm someone who cares about people. And I'm on this quest, you know, to learn more. Very early studies on mice in Israel, Spain, and the United States are now showing the potential of marijuana to kill cancer cells. We actually just got her up to a gram of cannabis oil as of last night, which is what, you know, a lot of the research says is the, the dose that really does all the cancer killing. The alleged cancer killing property is not the THC that gets you high. It's the CBD known as cannabinoid. Ricky's putting the spotlight on this controversial treatment in Weed the People. The film isn't made yet, and Rookie's looking for help raising money through WeedThePeopleMovie.com. Cooper is actually dying in certain areas. There's no new growth. I'm just thrilled. This is the most amazing news we could have ever gotten. It's <laughs> a good feeling. I can actually see the future. I can see walking little Sophie down the aisle and, and uh, you know, taking her to first dance recital and all those things that you want to do. This isn't the first documentary for Ricky. She also made The Business of Being Born, which did inspire a lot of new moms. It did. We've been giving kids the message, just say no to drugs. So why would a mother convince her 12-year-old to take marijuana? Sounds outrageous, but she says it's for his own good. Is it? Here's Chris Connolly. <laughs> The minutes of 12-year-old Ryan's day are filled with emotional turbulence and self-destructive behavior, bouts of rage or panic, self-loathing and lethargy. He is living a nightmare, and so is his mother. Judy, how old was Ryan when you started seeing this kind of behavior that troubled you? Uh, he was six years old. He was in the first grade. Judy Mendoza never imagined that her son would develop such an array of debilitating syndromes, including severe obsessive compulsive disorder. Open the door. He became completely incapacitated and incapable of functioning in the regular world. A couple of weeks ago, I pulled into the driveway and he came running out of the house, threw himself down on the hood of my car, said, I want you to kill me. I want you to run me down. I don't want to live anymore. I can't take this OCD anymore. What's it like when your son says, I don't want to live anymore. It's the worst thing you could ever hear as a mother. It really is. You want to do anything you can to take your child's suffering away. Judy says Ryan is pathologically afraid of the win of the number six. Ryan was pulled out of school earlier this year and spends much of his day with an A, playing video games as he did with me. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm bleeding. 
That's wow. That's not good. Judy says Ryan was treated with a host of drugs and therapies, yet nothing soothed her son. That is what led her to take an astonishing step and give her 12-year-old boy medical marijuana. My first gut reaction was, oh my God, <laughs> that seems really out there. That seems drastic, but I don't want to do all these antipsychotic medications anymore. They don't seem to be helping. And I thought to myself, what do I really have to lose? Judy lives in California, one of 14 states where medical marijuana is legal, purchased with a doctor's okay at one of these dispensaries. Kids don't smoke the drug. It hardly resembles marijuana as it's infused into butter or bread or into a tincture that can be placed under their tongue. It's like it just takes the edge off of his OCD. It's not like the OCD goes away when he has this medicine, but his ability to cope with it changes. And what are those moments like for you then? Heaven, because I get my little boy back. Judy's not the only one trying medical marijuana on her kid. In fact, she says she got the idea from watching this Good Morning America story. Miko Hester Perez says her 11-year-old, Joey, who has autism, had shrunk to 46 pounds before receiving the drug. I saved my son's life, and marijuana saved my son's life. Severe autism so confounds modern medicine that any treatment might seem understandable. But giving pot to a preteen with OCD? Is that why they call it dope? In what way are you not getting your son high? Well, the tincture that I give him has a very low level amount of THC in it, and that's the psychoactive part of the plant. Judy knew she'd be shocking her friends. You know the culture we live in, though, right? I know. Just say no, mm -hmm. gateway drug. Mm -hmm. What do their faces look like the first time you say you're doing what you're doing? It's like this. Like, if they're, they're, they're processing it. Like, what? I think if they look at the whole picture and they see what has happened with my child over the years and how close we have come to losing him, literally, it's really just giving them medicine to treat a symptom. But there are no double-blind studies the gold standard of scientific tests, to have proven or even shown that marijuana does anything for kids with autism or OCD. How young is too young to be using medicinal marijuana? How young is too young to use aspirin? How young is too young to use penicillin? A retired physician and professor at Harvard Medical School, Lester Grinspoon wrote the book on marijuana, literally. In the 70s, his son Danny, who had cancer, used the drug to counter the pain of his chemotherapy before his death. Now, he hears from mothers like Miko and Judy, but even he can't say it'll work. I can't guarantee it's going to do anything, but I can tell you it isn't going to harm him. It is remarkably non-toxic. You understand how some people hear of a boy taking marijuana and they're going, that doesn't seem right. It's because we have been brainwashed about this substance. There will come a time when people will recognize that this is a wonder drug of our times. It does so much in terms of relieving some of the symptoms which are very difficult for parents to deal with, let alone the child. I think the medical marijuana might actually be making their symptoms worse. The medical marijuana might just kind of be sedating them and not really addressing the underlying issues. Child psychiatrist Dr. Steven Sager at the ECHO Teen Substance Abuse Facility argues that this alternative treatment does present a serious risk for these kids. With marijuana, there's clear problems that can come up with it, including concentration problems, anxiety, depression. I think with a child, uh, you need to be ultra cautious. You know who else doesn't think marijuana for kids is such a hot idea? 12-year-old Griffin. Griffin, what was it like when you first heard that you might be taking medical marijuana? It was very, very scary, and I didn't want to take it, and I kept telling my mom, I don't want to. Chris Cortez says her son's been diagnosed with ADHD and has trouble focusing in class. The teachers are very um, frustrated with Griffin. Very frustrated. How do they express that frustration, Griffin? Yelling. Lots and lots of yelling. What's it like when you feel like a teacher has given up on you? It makes you feel bad. It makes you feel like you're really bad person. It upsets me. It makes me want to cry. <laughs> when Griffin was first diagnosed, he was prescribed Ritalin, but Chris wouldn't give it to him. She says she'll feel more comfortable giving him medical marijuana. 
because it's an organic substance. I don't want him to take any kind of manufactured drugs, and I kind of went back and forth on it because I don't want people to be upset with me, but then I had to realize that it doesn't matter what other people think. It's my son's health that matters. What do you hope medical marijuana will do for Griffin? I hope it helps him to concentrate more so he can learn better in school. That outcome might not mesh with our image of what young people using marijuana are like in school. But Chris looks forward to starting Griffin on a marijuana regimen before the beginning of the next school year, despite his concerns. I reassured him that even if it wasn't medical marijuana and it was Ritalin or something else, that he would still be scared. No matter what it is, he's still going to be a little scared until he actually tries it. As for Ryan, Judy is the first to say that medical marijuana hasn't cured her son. It's just a piece of the puzzle. It's like, it's almost like it's a Band-Aid. When it's difficult to reason with him because he's so upset, that's tough. It's very difficult to see him like that. And that is why I turn to this alternative treatment. As she's become an advocate for its use on kids, speaking to other families about the drug, Judy says she's also explored another side of marijuana with her son, the side we're more familiar with. I don't want my son to be high. But he hasn't had a chance to feel euphoria for many, many years. He's lost all his friends. And so I want him to have a little bit of the THC. I really do. I want him to feel some of that euphoria. When a mother from the small city of Madison, Minnesota, faces possible prison time this morning for giving her teenage son medical marijuana. He has a traumatic brain injury. Angela Brown says she turned to the treatment as a last resort, unable to watch her son suffer, suffer rather any longer. Adriana Diaz sat down with a family that could be split up by the law. Adriana, good morning. Good morning. Angela Brown traveled to Colorado to get a bottle of cannabis oil in hopes of bringing some comfort to her son. But what she calls a mother's instinct may land her behind bars. I, I broke the law, but I did it to save my son. For years, Angela Brown searched for a way to end her son's chronic pain. 15-year-old Trey Brown looks healthy, but pressure inside his head causes this. Pain stemming from a baseball accident in 2011. Where were you standing when you got hit? It's like right over there. A line drive to Trey's head caused bleeding in an area of his brain the size of a golf ball. Doctors feared he wouldn't survive. But when he finally woke up from a medically induced coma, his mother says the old Trey was gone. Who is he now? He's just a shell of himself, but he's in so much pain and that causes depression. With depression came daily migraines, muscle spasms, and uncontrollable outbursts like this one. Oh, please don't hit me, don't hit me. Like I cry, like every day before I go to bed, I'll end up crying. What does it feel like? Like, like my brain is like about to blow up. Hoping to ease his pain, Trey's parents tried 18 different medications, but little helped. Angela believes some of the drug side effects even made Trey suicidal. He told me, my mom, I don't want to live. I can't do this anymore. And what is going through your mind when you're hearing your child say these words to you? This is not fair. It's not fair. I have been so angry. I begged him. I said, we will find an answer. Desperate, she began researching the benefits of medical marijuana. The family drove to Colorado and obtained this bottle of cannabis oil. Legal there, but not in Minnesota. Angela says after a few drops, Trey's pain melted away. Did you think it was a miracle? Yeah, all God. Yeah. It was a miracle in a bottle. It stopped the pain and it stopped the muscle spasms. It was like helping me go to school until it, then it got taken away and then school was really hard again. Taken away when Trey's teachers asked why he was doing better in school. I said, well, I gave him an oil that we had gotten from Colorado, derived from the marijuana plant, and then you could feel the tension in the room. A week later, the sheriff's department confiscated the oil and county prosecutors charged Angela with child endangerment and requiring child protection. 
If convicted, she could face up to two years in prison and $6,000 in fines. I was trying to prevent him from being hurt. But you did get an illegal substance yes. and give it to him. Illegal substance in Minnesota, not illegal in other states. CBS News reached out to the county prosecutor, law enforcement, and Trey School District. All declined our requests for an interview, citing the ongoing case. If Angela does go to jail, she fears most for her children. Who would take care of my kids? My boys or mama's boys? They need you? <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. I need them. I need them. In May, Minnesota did become the 22nd state to approve medical marijuana, but the law doesn't go into effect until next year, and the Brand family says they simply can't wait. Wow. I'm so glad you did this story. I'm hoping that people will look at it and say, come on. You know, at some point, common sense has to prevail. They're clearly not abusing the system, and it's helping her son. Yeah. They say they actually want to move to Colorado yeah. once this is all resolved, but whether or not the mother will join the family has yet to be seen. Wow. Adriana, thank you so much. And a groundbreaking study has surprising results. It says the active chemical in marijuana kills brain cancer cells. The study suggests that THC causes brain cancer cells to essentially eat themselves. In both studies with mice and humans, tumors exposed to the drug shrank. The study's authors say patients didn't suffer any toxic side effects, and the results could be used to develop new strategies for preventing tumor growth. A study out today found a new treatment for epilepsy is showing great promise. It uses an extract of marijuana. Here's Dr. John LaPook. You're going to go to school. From age one, Hank Kovach suffered from severe epilepsy that could not be controlled with medicine. His mother, Megan, says in one day he could have more than 25 seizures. I thought he was playing in the other room. He was not playing in the other room. He was convulsing, turning blue, and that's when I thought I lost him. It's been such a good boy getting them all hooked up. Last summer, she eagerly enrolled her son in a small trial designed to see if medical marijuana could help. Twice a day, Hank receives a marijuana liquid extract called Epidiolex. The medicine does not contain THC, the ingredient that can cause euphoria, anxiety, and paranoia. Megan says the change has been dramatic. We instantly saw results. He was smiling again. We noticed the decrease in seizures. He was able to transition, and at this point, he was finally able to gain cognitive skills. 137 children and young adults, average age 11, were given the drug. After 12 weeks, parents reported the number of seizures declined 45 to 50 percent. Dr. Linda Locks of Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago is one of the researchers. Some of the kids clearly became more verbal, better coordination. I had one child who started walking while they were using the medications. Where's Harold the helicopter? Hank's epilepsy was so severe, at age seven, he still cannot speak. But he's able to attend school and has not had a seizure in months. My goal for him is to hear his voice, to hear him talk. We just want him to be happy. It's been known since the early 70s that the active ingredient Hank received called cannabidiol can block seizures in animals. But how it works is unclear. What is clear, Scott, that much more research is needed, especially placebo-controlled trials. Promising news. John, thanks for that. Ole Miss is home to many things, including the only legally grown marijuana crop in our nation. And a new development there is creating quite a buzz tonight. Faculty and student researchers say they've created a new pain reliever in the form of a patch. Action News 5's Janice Broach joins us now with the story you'll see only on Fox. This here, just touching the smell, is really is a wonderful smell. Dr. Mahmoud El Soli is a faculty member at the School of Pharmacy at Ole Miss. He and his team have been working inside this lab for nearly seven years to find alternative uses for THC, the main psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. The plant itself has a great potential for good medicines coming out of the cannabis plant, but certainly not in smoking of the drug. You heard him. He is not a fan of legalizing pot, but he is a fan of his newest creation, a pot pain reliever in the form of a patch that is placed over the gum line in patients who have problems taking the drug in pill form. In addition to pain, it will include things like reducing the intraocular pressure and therefore be good for, for glaucoma, it will be good for alleviating the nausea and vomiting 
anything associated with chemotherapy will also be good for uh, appetite stimulation. Formulas were first screened in rabbits, then pigs. Dr. El Soli believes the right formula will lead to testing in humans. So we're not, not really introducing anything strange to the body other than the THC itself. We are just having to make it so that we make it possible to be absorbed through the mucosa. More than 77,000 samples were prepared for analysis on this project. Early tests show the patch can work for up to 10 hours. Because of the way it's absorbed, it's almost like absorbed from the lungs, right? like the smoke. When you smoke, it goes from the lungs to the whole entire body before going to the liver. Unlike the oral, it goes to the liver first and then goes to the rest of the body. The patch grew out of earlier experiments Dr. El Soli says didn't go over so well. He first tried making a pot suppository. Jay Leno was, you know, had it on, on his show when we first came up with the product and say, you know, that researcher at Ole Miss uh, has developed a way to... Uh, to, uh, to, to administer, you know, marijuana by suppository. You know how he came up with this idea? Uh, they said, how? And he said, well, he was smoking a joint, and then he saw the cups and he went. Janice Broach, Action News 5. <laughs> All right. Ole Miss has not used its outdoor marijuana field since the year 2007. Instead, everything is grown in a lab, which is under 24-hour surveillance by the DEA. Research on the pot patch got its kickstart thanks to a national grant. You can learn more about it at WMCTV.com, Ursula. A clip from Dr. Sanjay Gupta's documentary, Weed, which airs on CNN this Sunday night. Sanjay spent a year investigating the fight over medical marijuana. More and more Americans are using it. Just a few days ago, Washington, D.C. opened up its first medical marijuana dispensary. And CNN's chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, joins me now. Sanjay, welcome to you. Thank you. Thanks for having so, me. So, come on, you've been looking at this for a year. And I want to remind you that in nine, uh, 2009, you wrote a Time magazine article entitled Why I Would Vote No on Pot. You've changed your mind. I, I have, and, and, uh, and as part of uh, you know, my thinking reason, I, I've apologized for some of the earlier reporting because I think you know, we've been terribly and systematically misled in this country for some time, and I, I, was, I did part of that misleading. You know, if, if you look at all the papers that are written in the United States about marijuana, the vast majority of them are about the harm. That we fund studies on harm, we don't fund studies on benefit nearly as much. So it gives a distorted picture. But you know, I didn't look far enough, I didn't look deep enough, I didn't look at labs in other countries that are doing some incredible research, I didn't listen to the chorus of patients who said, not only does marijuana work for me, it's the only thing that works for me. I took the DEA at their word yeah. when they said it's a Schedule One substance and has no medical applications. There was no scientific basis for them to say that. So when, when New York Mayor Bloomberg was quoted as saying medical marijuana is the greatest hoax of all time, what do you say to him? I, I'm surprised. You know, I mean, I, I uh, follow a lot of the mayor's comments quite closely. I listen to those comments as well. He, as part of those same comments, he was saying that the potency of marijuana has gone up. That is true. It has gone up probably over the last several years. But I, I urge him to look at the scientific papers. I was just looking at them again in preparation for your show. The science is there. This isn't anecdotal. This isn't the realm, in the realm of conjecture anymore. I mean, for a long time, we've just ignored these papers. But this was a drug, you know, that was used for thousands of years. Now, in your documentary, you get into the effects of medical marijuana, which sometimes can be quite instant. It's quite dramatic. It, it, it really can. It works, and it can work very quickly. In fact, let, let me just show you. I always have two strains. I Meet 19-year-old Chaz Moore. He uses many different strains of marijuana, many of them high in CBD, to treat his rare disorder of the diaphragm. My ab will, like, lock up. Like, That's why he's talking this way, almost speaking in hiccups, like he can't catch his breath. It's called myoclonus diaphragmatic flutter. This fluttering here, it's annoying, and it, but it becomes painful yeah. um, well, pretty quickly, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, after like 15, 20 minutes, this is where I can like start to really feel. He's about to show me how the marijuana works. He's been convulsing now for seven minutes. How quickly do you expect this to work? Within like the first five minutes. <laughs> and I'm done. Like, that's it. That's it. It was actually less than a minute depending on the attack in the day I mean that is pretty extraordinary 
It, he, he was on so many different meds, Piers. It, it, was, it was a table full of meds that doctors had prescribed for him for this condition, including Oxycontin, Valium, any of those medications in too high a dose could have been really problematic, and they didn't work. I mean, look, you know, the, the proof is, is, is becoming increasingly clear, I think, if you look for it. Its name is THC, and it was discovered back in 1964 in a lab in Jerusalem by chemist Raphael Meshulam. Cannabis had not been well investigated, which was strange. After all, it was being used illegally or illegally by millions of people, and yet we didn't know that much about it. So I thought it's a good idea to uh, look at it again from a modern point of view. In the lab, Meshulam and his colleagues broke cannabis down and zeroed in on the chemical components that might be causing its effects. We isolated about 10 compounds. Surprisingly, out of the 10 compounds we isolated, only one, which now is known as delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, in short THC, only one causes the well-known uh, high. We tested it in humans, many of my friends, and we saw that the compound is effective as we expected it to be. The identification of THC answered one question, but raised another. Just what did it do to the brain? I had always assumed that people knew how marijuana worked. It surprised me, actually, when I began looking in the research literature that, that it was really clear that no one really knew how it worked. In 1988, Alin Howlett found the answer. She discovered that deep inside the brain, THC molecules activate a previously unknown network of specialized chemical receptors. So that was proof that there is a receptor protein in the brain that can bind to the uh, THC like a key in a lock. It was very exciting because what that meant to us was we had a tool that could be used for studying and other researchers could use it as well. And people could study where the receptor was in the brain. Howlett and other scientists found the receptors in the hippocampus, which forms memories, the cerebellum, which controls movement, and the frontal cortex, where we think. Here were these receptors that this chemical produced by a plant out in the world just so happen to have the precise combination to unlock. What an extraordinary thing that is. Um, is that why that receptor network existed, so that people could get high? We don't have those receptors just so that people can get high smoking pot. Receptors are developed in neurons so that they can communicate with a chemical that the body makes. So that was the logic behind going in and trying to extract a compound in the brain that would act just like marijuana did. And in 1992, proof came that the brain does make a compound very much like THC. It was discovered by none other than Raphael Meshulam, who named it anandamide. We call it the brain's own marijuana because the compound that is made by the brain, anandamide, shares all the properties in terms of at the receptor level and cellular level that uh, THC has. It turns out that when anandamide is released in the brain, like marijuana, it affects such basic things as appetite, pain, and memory. And it plays a critical role in a sometimes underappreciated mental function, forgetting. When I first heard that, it didn't seem adaptive to me to have a drug for forgetting. Memory, we understand, has great survival utility. You, you, you know, you learn that that's a poisonous mushroom or that's a dangerous animal and you stay away and you remember that. But why would forgetting be adaptive? And I asked Mishulam this question and he said, well, tell me, do you really want to remember all the faces you saw on the subway this morning? Forgetting well is almost as important as remembering well. Forgetting is about editing. It's about taking the flood, the ocean of sense information coming at you and forgetting everything but what's important. 
So life is not just about accumulating new memories. Memory can cripple us, too. Get up! Get up! You have soldiers returning from war zones that are traumatized by experiences that, in effect, they can't unlearn. So if you could help them unlearn that, essentially a productive kind of forgetting, either with a drug or uh, some other kind of regime, that would be incredibly useful. Back now at 742 with the new controversy tied to medical marijuana. It is legal now in 17 states, and now some parents are using it to treat their very young children. Dr. Nancy Snyderman is NBC's chief medical editor. Nancy, good morning to you. Hey, Savannah, we've talked about medical marijuana for adults for a long time, but increasingly doctors, parents, and communities are getting behind this for children. It is a controversy that is not going to go away. This mother is making a drug deal buying marijuana. Is this the Roma oil for you today? Yes. But this sale is not for her. It's for her 10-year-old son, and it's all perfectly legal. This pot is being grown specifically for Zakai Jackson in Colorado by a team of brothers who legally grow medical marijuana and process it for him into a special syrup for sale at their drugstore. Heather Jackson says this dope is saving her son's life. When Zakai was six months old, he was diagnosed with a form of epilepsy that causes life-threatening seizures. Nice. He was having 60 to 250 seizures a day. He would stop breathing. You know, all the air <sighs> leaves his lungs and he does not take another breath until that seizure is over. She says she tried 17 medications and treatments. Nothing worked. Desperate, Heather made a tough decision to try one last doctor's recommendation. We are Christians, we are conservative, and we're using medical marijuana. So that's kind of a big hump for people to get over. Heather says the results were immediate. I probably stared at him for a good three hours after his first dose, and then I fell asleep. I didn't feel any seizures after his very first dose. He has been seizure free for nine months. In 17 states, kids are able to get medical marijuana to treat everything from autism to cancer to seizures. Their lives are completely changed. They can, they can eat, they can put on weight, they can sleep, they can actually have a normal childhood. Dr. Getty says that the marijuana plant, also known as cannabis, can dial down nerve cell stimulation and stop seizures without getting kids stoned. And that's because medical marijuana can be bred with a low level of THC, the compound that gets you high. But critics include the American Academy of Pediatrics, which says that growers are jumping the gun because this remedy has not been clinically tested. It's not enough just to believe that something is going to be a good medication. You really need to test it. A couple of generations ago, people were recommending tobacco. Even physicians were recommending tobacco as a good method of relaxation or to relieve stress. It seems unbelievable now. Is your concern at this point that if someone has a medical problem in their child and they turn to marijuana, they're swapping one problem for another? I think that they are putting their child at risk of long-term consequences of marijuana use that we don't fully understand. Still, Heather says it's worth it nice. because after a decade, she can finally get to know her son. We never really got to meet Zakai because he started having seizures so early. Zakai is incredibly funny and charming and loving. It's been really nice to see him, you know, come awake. No one is saying this is a first-line drug of choice, but increasingly, as children need, need the solution for problems that traditional medicine isn't treating, increasingly parents are turning to this avenue. And I think in, we're not going to see the FDA step in and have traditional clinical trials, but this is a controversy that's not going to go away. And because it's in 17 states, I do think this is a trend in this country. Thought-provoking piece, Nancy. Thank you, you so bet, much. Sam. And now to one mother and her controversial treatment for her son's autism. She says medical marijuana baked into brownies not only changed some profound behaviors of her child, but also saved his life. She's speaking out for the first time in network television here with us this morning on GMA. And we will hear from her in a moment. But first, more on her story. Let's go. Hold on. Let's go. Today, 10-year-old Joey Perez is thriving, but his mother Miko believes it wasn't conventional medicine that cured him of some of the severe symptoms of autism. Instead, she credits these brownies baked with a controversial ingredient 
medicinal marijuana. Any kid would love brownies, mom's brownies. She believes the drug prescribed by a doctor has saved Joey's life. Before the treatment, she described him as hostile and dangerous, and his weight dropped to 46 pounds. You could see the bones in his chest. My son was going to die. Within weeks, she says he relaxed, made sounds for the first time, and gained 38 pounds. He went from taking 13 different kinds of medicine a day to just three. Joey's psychiatrist warns marijuana is not a cure for autism, but says its effect on Joey's brain triggered hunger and altered his personality for the better. He was clearly starving. He had droopy eyes. He had very poor eye contact. After he had began the medical marijuana, he was very bright-eyed and smiling and laughing. He was just a totally different boy. Miko isn't the first parent to use cannabis to help their autistic child. A mother in Rhode Island blogs about giving it to her nine-year-old boy and his cookies and tea. And the parents of Sam, a 10-year-old California boy, claim the medical marijuana they put in his melon has worked wonders. But many doctors say treating a child's autism that way is dangerous. He's intoxicated, he's stoned. It means that he's under the influence of a drug and may have an addiction. It can cause psychosis, may lead to schizophrenia. There is no evidence at all at this time and no reason to prescribe any kind of marijuana for a child with autism. Dill Miko believes without it, Joey may not be alive today. For Good Morning America, Andrea Canning, ABC News. And Joey's mother, Miko Hester Perez, is here along with Ted Cromwell, who's an attorney and longtime friend of the family. And thank you for being here. Thank I you. watched your face. I heard your reaction when that doctor said stoned. He's stoned. You said not at all. What, what, what do you mean? Not at all. Um, my son, for whatever reason, and I know that we need to uh, do further research, it has the marijuana has balanced my son. All right, let's begin at the beginning. And I want to establish, first of all, for people who've never heard of this and first reaction is shock. How did you hear about it? I, at first, um, I, I did some research. Um, and I found a doctor uh, that actually had a, 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 a protocol and it, for medical marijuana for children diagnosed with autism. And people have asked, what is your position on marijuana? Have you ever taken marijuana? Do you use marijuana? No, I do not. This is completely out of my character. Um, I've never used it? Never. And what were the behaviors that drove you to seek out this dramatic, if not controversial? My son uh, had self-injurious behaviors. He was extremely aggressive. Um, he would run out of our home. Um, it's he was a danger. Yes. Right? When he would he just was, dart away. He was a danger to himself and others. And how soon after you gave him this did it change? Within hours. Within hours, um, he had requested food that we had never seen him eat before. Um, his demeanor had changed. He was calm. And I want to repeat again, he at one time I know was on 13 medications, then he had right. come down to six, right. and now how many does he need? He's on three, technically two and a half. We're, we're using one as needed, and Dr. Hedrick is working with me to remove one more. Mr. Cromwell, let me ask you, because the American Academy of Pediatrics has said that this is not scientifically validated, that it has not been tested, it could be dangerous for children. Are some of these providers, and these are medical providers in California, but are some of these providers just taking advantage of a, a truly heartbreaking situation? Well, the key comment in that statement is that it hasn't been tested, and that's why we're here on Good Morning America. We want to bring awareness to the situation. Miko started a foundation. We want to open lines of communication so it can be tested properly. The quote from the original doctor said there's no evidence. This is the time to do the testing, do the research, to get the evidence to prove it. And how much are you giving each week? And I, I read that you don't have to give it every week, that no, in fact it can no. carry over week to week. The, the medications that he was previously on, we were giving him three times a day, okay? Right now, we may give him a brownie once every couple of days, every two to three days. This, we're not um, overloading his system with the medical marijuana and and the brownies are, are no bigger than a quarter 
<laughs> I mean, we're, we're small, very small, quarter size, amount. yes. Yes. Um, and he's healthy. I know he can't speak. He still can't communicate with you. But to anyone out there again who says, marijuana, we know what marijuana does. It's recreational. It is about being stoned, as we said at the beginning. What do you say back to them when you look in his eyes? I saved my son's life, and marijuana saved my son's life. When a mother hears that their son is knocking on death doors, you will do anything to save your child's life. And the research that we need for this medical marijuana needs to be done, and it needs to be done now. Well, again, Miko, uh, thank you so much for coming in, and we know that these are these are dilemmas that are right at the center of your heart. Yes. And we thank you so much for being here. And let us know what you think. Coming up uh, next, we'll be back. Thank you. The cannabis plant grows almost anywhere. It is found in Asia, China, Malaysia. It's found in the Middle East, it's found in Africa, and it also grows, of course, in Europe and the US. It is used by hundreds, millions of uh, people for the changes it causes in our thoughts, in our behavior, in our feeling. Unfortunately, it is certainly a dangerous drug. It can cause tolerance, it can cause addiction in some cases. Luckily, addiction caused by cannabis is not as potent as that of cocaine and heroin and can be treated uh, relatively with ease. Until uh, quite recently, actually, until the mid-60s, the active constituent was not known. We identified a compound, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, which is the only one that causes these uh, changes. For many years, it was unknown whether these changes uh, are just a non-specific action of, of THC, but in the mid-80s, it was found that there is a receptor in the brain that uh, is acted upon by THC and starts a cascade of reactions which causes the changes that we identify as high. But how come that the brain has a receptor for a plant constituent? After all, uh, the, our brain doesn't have a receptor for every plant constituent, actually doesn't have a receptor for any plant constituent. So we started working on the assumption that maybe there are compounds in the brain that act on this particular receptor, and THC in the plant actually mimics the action of the compounds in the brain. Indeed, about 10, 15 years ago, we were uh, able to isolate two compounds. One we called anandamide, and the other is known as 2-AG, that stimulate, that bind to this particular receptor, and they start a cascade of reactions that we identify as high. Why do we have that system of receptor, endogenous cannabinoids? Why? I mean, just in order to cause high? No. This is a very important physiological system which is involved in a large number of uh, physiological reactions and in large number of therapeutic reactions. For example, anandamide and 2-AG are involved in neuroprotection. When we have a brain trauma, for example, the brain tries to reduce the damage by overproducing, if you wish, these compounds which lower the damage. Uh, they are also involved in anxiety. It is involved in sleep. It is involved in essentially all physiological reactions that have been investigated. Chances are that this particular system will uh, be the basis on which uh, a large number of drugs will be developed. At the moment, there is one major drug that has been introduced in Europe. A company produced an antagonist 
to the cannabinoid system and they use it in order to reduce the appetite and also to enhance metabolism of fats so that ultimately we see an effect on obesity, an effect on all these diseases that are associated with obesity. Many other companies are working on many different aspects of uh, cannabinoids, for example, inflammation, uh, neurological diseases, maybe Alzheimer, and I assume that within the next 10 years we shall have a whole array of new drugs as many companies are at present working on all these aspects. roughly estimate that uh, about a third of the people are receiving letters of recommendation and approval for primarily emotional or mental mm -hmm. problems and that um, cannabis is a unique psychotropic in this context <clears throat> in that uh, it has uh, effects on both cognition and affect that also are inextricably connected with <clears throat> different kinds of uh, physical functioning. For example, with anorexia, people get inadequate nutrition because of um, their anxiety causing a suppression of the appetite and that uh, when they receive cannabis, uh, <clears throat> the nutrition is uh, improved because the Peristalsis and the spasm, the spasm is relieved, peristalsis is promoted, uh, so also evacuation, which then uh, produces improved mood and improved functioning. Um, with regard to uh, cognition, um, this also includes uh, people with thought disorders, and you might find this kind of unusual, but um, there are certain aspects of um, cognitive functioning that cannabis helps, like uh, suppressing or decreasing obsessive thinking and also paranoid ideation and uh, paranoid delusional thought. Um, interestingly, the uh, short-term memory loss that people experience when they acutely medicate with usually uh, inhaled cannabis um, they can't hold a uh, paranoid delusion long enough. <laughs> and the same goes for obsessive compulsive disorder because they can't uh, keep up this uh, string of pathologic associations. Um, also, the modulation of affect also affects the uh, cognitive behavior with decreased anxiety this decreases the pressure for this abnormal type of uh, thought. Um, I believe that a new category is warranted, that cannabis fits, uh, and that's easement. If you look that up in the dictionary, you'll see several meanings. And one of the main meanings is giving ease, not the property legalistic kind of uh, um, a passage or going on to some property and getting certain rights, but easement as um, a calming effect. And this is what I believe cannabis um, more closely approximates. It's not the same as a benzodiazepine, which produces sedation and, ironically, depression. <laughs> a lot. It, there is no free lunch pharmacologically. <laughs> so people they do, not, do not like the benzodiazepines and other sedatives for these kinds of reasons. And cannabis helps restore emotional um, responsivity in a normal way. 
and this also goes along with uh, people with their paranoid ideation and um, disturbance of interpersonal relationships with uh, certain people with thought disorder uh, they note that they're more able to relate to others which then improves their self-esteem and their social functioning you're never, you're never going to find this written anywhere because of uh, <clears throat> the the psychiatric literature being horribly biased. And I've uh, looked through the APA publications going back maybe 70 years, and it all is uh, tainted with um, the antisocial element and causing, calling it um, dysfunctionality or character defect or other kinds of pejorative condemnatory terms. Um, and it's all pill pushing. It's all <clears throat> medication. And to that end, we really don't know what is happening. And this extends not just to psychotropics, but I'm going to read you a short letter to John A. Kitzhaber, MD, Director, Center for Evidence-Based Policy, <clears throat> Oregon Health and Science University. <clears throat> and this is who I suggest if you want to contact to embarrass a little bit. Uh, on February 25th, I happened to view a panel presentation by your organization on C-SPAN on the cost-benefit study of different pharmaceuticals contracted by AARP. The sum total of that, that uh, panel was they could not develop any cost-benefits analyses because in, in analyzing <clears throat> the pharmaceutical literature, they discovered it was all promotional rather than objective and scientific. So everything masquerading as science is not. So based upon California clinical experience with a range of chronic conditions, our findings <laughs> indicate a significant advantage over other pharmaceuticals conventionally utilized because of improved quality of life and fewer adverse effects. Consequently, we request the opportunity to discuss our findings with you. Attached is a, a list of conditions. And guess what the response was? <laughs> so I'm glad this is going over cable TV in the Portland area. And hopefully, uh, somebody out there in the viewing audience can, um, can give the center a call and ask them to uh, include cannabis in their studies, and especially about the mental health issue. I, I would be fascinated to hear the response, but I won't hold my breath. May I interject just very briefly? There's research I'm sure you guys are all aware of about the synergistic effects of the receptor effects of opiates and cannabinoids where they basically are hitchhiking with each other, and small, much smaller doses of both medications create the same benefit with, of course, much less side effects. Mm -hmm. These are really remarkable findings, and, and I really regret that there aren't physicians who are just monitoring the, re the reduction in the prescription patterns of their patients if they doubt that cannabis is useful. You think that's new? If you read marijuana medical papers uh, in the Ohio State Medical Society meeting on cannabis in 1860, a Dr. Frondler from Ohio reported that uh, using an alternative, alternating courses of opiates and cannabis for treating chronic condition, conditions reduced dependence on opiates. 1859, this was written. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is something new. No, we're, we're talking about the takeover by Big Farm and ruining policy through their special interest money. And furthermore, the fact that this whole system, this mo can I use the, my favorite Oh, phrase? why not? <laughs> Monomolecular mercantile madness. <laughs> this is all patent office driven. If you look back to what it was before the single molecule ascended to its uh, role in current uh, commercial medicine, 
um, you'll see that it, it's all secondary to what can get patented. And then they claim that the newly patented material is increasingly better, blah, 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 but then you see what's happened to the literature. It's gotten thoroughly corrupted and perverted so that you don't know what's happening. And here we have now a, a drug-seeking, drug-hungering public convinced that they need all sorts of uh, combinations of uh, patentable materials. And, this, and it's really sickening our society. And when they started directly advertising to the public, for psychotropics especially, ask your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Social anxiety disorder. Um, all these these kinds of um, influences to influence you and their bottom line. Any other questions? It was inevitable that eventually cannabis would meet its perfect partner. Us. Whether you like it or not, each and every one of us is fundamentally wired to respond to cannabis. Now, receptors are not built in our brain or anywhere in our body, of course, or animal, animal bodies, because there is a plant out there that will produce a compound that acts on them. That just doesn't work that way. Receptors are found in our body because we produce compound that will activate those receptors. So obviously we thought that there should be uh, endogenous compounds which act on those receptors. The fact that there is a plant compound, a tetrahydrocannabinol, a THC, which acts on those receptors is just a quirk of nature. So uh, we've got Mr. John Cornett standing by in the wings. I just want to say very quickly that if you or a loved one need help finding a doctor who can help you get a medical marijuana permit, you can call us at uh, toll free 1-800-723-0188 or if you're out that's 1-800-723-0188 if you're here in Portland it's 503-281-5100 and uh, that's it for the, this week tune in next week here's Mr. John Cornett and help us restore hemp <laughs> good night